Welcome to ASD's Water Dowser Mastermind Conference Call. These talks, lasting for about an hour and open to everyone, are scheduled for the third Monday of each month at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Today is the 20th of January, 2020. I'm G from Northern California Dowsers in Redding, California. Jeanette and I will be joining your hosts, Sharon Hope and Ed Stillman, for tonight's program featuring part two of Susan Collins. This will be recorded and accessible at ASD's website under the Members Only section. Please hold your questions until the end of the guest speaker's talk. Thanks. I'm now turning the program over to Sherry. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Water Dowser's uh, Mastermind Conference Call. And you know, tonight we, we have Susan Collins, and it's part two. Um, I also want to make a few announcements. And Roxanne Louise asked me to uh, tell everyone that her teleconference will be tomorrow, and it's at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And it's going to be on the mainly about the fires in Australia, and uh, but not just that, but it's like what you can do when you have uh, dramatic issues like that in your area, and or other things. Uh, you can read about that on dowsers.org, and there's the uh, call-in phone numbers there also. So go to the ASD website at dowsers.org for that. There is a, another teleconference going on, of course, next month on the second Tuesday. That's also on the uh, Dowsers website. Our next teleconference will be February 17th. Uh, we will be having Jenny Matasha. That's Louis Matasha's daughter. And she will be talking about her water dowsing stories and techniques. So we're looking forward to that. And that's on the third Monday of February, February 17th. So mark that in your calendars. So tonight, we are having Susan Collins and part two of her talk, and we're looking forward to that. So I'm going to turn this over to Ed Stillman, who's going to give you a, a summary and also a, a little bio about Susan before she starts talking. Okay, Ed, thank yeah, you. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, Susan Collins is an internationally acclaimed dowsing teacher, <clears throat> keynote speaker, and workshop leader. She uses traditional dowsing tools as well as the power of heart and thought to detect and transform non-beneficial earth, environmental, psychic, and uh, other energy patterns. She has presented at many international and regional conferences across North America, the United Kingdom, in Italy, Japan, and in the Middle East. Also, uh, Susan has a dynamic global consulting practice. Now, today, Susan is going to be um, discussing several new items, several new things to talk about, and I'm just going to run these through for you so you have a little bit of an idea for this. She will be talking about mechanics of the well construction, how geology affects siting the water well, uh, communicating with the spirits of place, triage protocol, finding the depth and volume of the water, uh, diverting a stream of water, map dowsing to find the water location, and transforming water quality. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to, to uh, Susan. And it's a great pleasure, Susan, to have you here tonight with us. Please go ahead. Okay, well, thank you very much, Ed and Sherry, and thanks to everybody listening. Uh, I'm very pleased to be back here in the new year uh, doing part two of the water well dosing. So as uh, Ed and Sherry have mentioned, if you missed part one, you can go on to the ASD website and, um, and listen to all of that. 
Um, I'll just do a little quick preview or review of what we did last time, just in case uh, you, you didn't have a chance to do that. Basically, I'm a uh, past president of the Canadian Society of Dozers. I've been doing water wells for about 15 years. And last time I talked to you, I said that I think I'd only had maybe one uh, dry hole. So, of course, one should never say anything like that, because uh, since... I, I got information on a well I did, and in fact, it came in as a dry hole. So I was uh, I was uh, saddened by that. It was a place where there were four or five dry holes around it, so it was a very tough place. But you know, it just goes to show that we do everything we can, we do all the research, and it doesn't always work. So you can either shut yourself down and never do it again, or just keep trying. And I had another feedback from another client where the I got the depth wrong. I had called it at, I think, 75 feet, and it came in at something like 200 feet. Plenty of water, but a lot deeper down. So as my uh, as my client on that one said, well, I guess you really don't know what's down there, do you? And uh, and it's true, we don't. We just we just do the best we can. Um, what The way I always start, prepare, is just by starting with the dosing protocol. And uh, I think it's important to do something to prepare yourself to get out there and, and, and dose because it's, it's a lot of money if you're wrong. And just like uh, jumping out of your car and just twirling your pendulum around is, is probably not the um, most effective way to do it. So typically we drive to a site, uh, probably always drive to a site. So while you're driving, you can do what I call uh, a dosing protocol. And I'll just review that really quickly. Um, first off, you want to balance your physical body. And again, if you've just gotten out of a car, driven for an hour, you know, you're stiff, you're thirsty, maybe you have to go to the bathroom. So you take care of those physical needs and kind of do some breathing. Um, I connect in with uh, using my pendulum. I've got my rods out already by this time. And I connect to uh, the intelligent and beneficial energies of nature and the divine source and ask for assistance from beneficial beings. I uh, clear myself of non-beneficial energies so that I'm not thinking about uh, uh, what I'm going to make for dinner or what, uh, what somebody said to me the other day. I clear out. It's like emptying the mental bucket, get all rid of all the other thoughts. And then uh, maximize the energy field and our sensitivities for the task at hand. Typically, if you're on the if you're on a call, you're you're out there in the car. You've already spoken to your client, so you have some idea of what you're trying to do, which is in this case a water well, and you probably already know how big a family it is, if it's residential or if it's a commercial or agricultural property. Uh, you'll have some idea before you get there of what you're looking for. I personally find it quite difficult to jump out of the car and then find out I'm being asked to dose uh, 200 gallons a minute for a potato farm. Uh, that I, I, need, I need to prepare mentally and emotionally uh, so that I can get into my detached place where I'm just really trying to be in service, trying to do the best I can with water. And I think uh, with everything that we do, if we can get to that place of detached compassion that we would be more accurate because um, sometimes you know your client they don't have a lot of money it's a big deal if you have a dry hole it's a very big deal for these people and maybe and maybe they have to sell the farm maybe they have to leave or maybe they can't build the house you know quite often i find um, i'm called in to do the well after the house is built so one of the things we need, need to do for education with clients, if, if somebody's approaching you and saying, hey, I think we need your services, you want to ask them, well, what state are you at? Like, is this an existing property? Um, I mentioned last time I've, I've dosed some wells on 100-year-old farms that never had a functional well. Is this an old place or is this a new place or um, what are you trying to do? I always suggest to people, if possible, that I get in there to dose before they build the house. It makes sense. And with luck, before they've even sighted, um, you know, dug a foundation or anything. Because if you can get out there on the land and walk around and find the water, then it's much easier if you find the well source first to move the house 20 feet over. So you get, you get your, your, uh, 
you get your water well first. And, and truly, it's probably the most important thing, getting that water. And if you don't have water, you don't have anything. You, of course, you can put a cistern in. And we'll talk a bit about cisterns and technology of well mechanics, et cetera. But, but just uh, the point here, you have a dosing protocol. You do something that gets you into a state of detached compassion. You don't know. You don't care. One of my first teachers, uh, the late Bruce McGill, told me that the best way to dose is from a place of ignorance and apathy. You don't know and you don't care. So that uh, that sounds very harsh, and uh, you don't want to tell your client you don't know and you don't care. But sometimes that's the, the best, calmest way to go into a job. Anyway, so you do some kind of dosing protocol. And if uh, folks want to send me an email, I will send a free two-page copy of my dosing protocol. Send it to susan at doser.ca. Anyway, so we go on site. We've done the dosing protocol. Um, I also, that, that's one of the things I, I use. The other uh, protocol I use is a directions protocol. And I mentioned that in uh, part one. And this is within the North American Native tradition where we face various directions and ask for the assistance of the energies from each of those directions. And for me, it's uh, kind of metaphorical. In the east are, is the beginning. In the south are the resources. The west is completion. North is ethics. So I, uh, in, in uh, turning to each of the directions with my L rods, opening my L rods, asking for the assistance of the energies of that direction, I'm uh, metaphorically asking for grandmothers and grandfathers of Mother Earth, but I'm also tuning into the electromagnetic place of where I am. Because once again, you, we've just jumped out of the car, and our, our electro, personal electromagnetic frequencies can be a little bit scrambled. Uh, I tend not to listen to the radio while I'm driving to a job, because that's uh, quite mentally distracting, distracting. and having the, the, the less electromagnetic interference you have, going in the better off you are so again i try not i try turn off my bluetooth in the car i turn off the wi-fi on my on my phone so i try to reduce the amount of electromagnetic interference while i'm driving there and of course while i'm uh, while i'm on site i think i mentioned this last time but always get your client to turn off any electrical fences they have. It could be a cattle fence if it's a farm or a dog fence, you know, those buried electrical fences, because they can mess you up quite a bit because you're picking up those frequencies. The other thing to know about is where are the buried electrical cables if they've got that in already. So if it's a pristine site, you're pretty clear on some of that. But if it's a site that's been used, before there can be a lot of electromagnetic interference. The other thing, of course, to find out is uh, where is all the septic, but um, we'll go on that. The, um, the other directions I, I refer to are southeast, which is Father Sky, southwest the grandfathers, northwest Mother Earth, northeast the grandmothers. So I mentioned this last time as well, in, in the grandfathers direction of the southwest, um, there live the male skydowsers that have uh, that I have known. And when we say skydowsers and the American Society of Dowsers, we're talking about um, the, our teachers and the practitioners who have died and who whose energy still persists. So it is my experience that uh, with some of my teachers who have passed on um, that I can experience them. Uh, the first time I experienced that I was uh, doing a well, and I mentioned again the late Bruce McGill. He always liked to teach uh, to find a to find a spot and then find the water dome, and then walk around it and find out how many veins there are. So that's not normally what I do. I usually just I'm very I'm very direct. I just say take me to the best spot to place uh, a well. That's my normal technique. But I found one day I was. I was doing Bruce's um, teaching. I said, ah. So I, and then I, I realized, oh, the energy of, of Bruce is with me. And, um, and so since then, I've always asked my teachers to assist. And these are, uh, so I've got my living teachers and I've got my energy teachers, which I appreciate very much. So as we're 
interacting with the intelligence of nature and the planet itself and our 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 energy teachers um, we are moving into interdimensional communication and experience so at the beginning of my practice about 20 years ago i was always being kind of shut down because i didn't know how to protect myself energetically uh, things would just come in. I, I remember once doing a, a pro- clearing on a property and I said, are there any other energies that would like to communicate? And in my mind, I was thinking, is there anything else that needs to be healed or balanced or whatever? But what the message came back was, and I, at this, and in those days I used a message chart, which was like a one person Ouija, which is quite a, a tricky thing to use accurately because it tends to allow other types of trickster energy in but in any case in that one instance I said are there any other beings that would like to communicate and I got a message back on the on the little alphabet chart get Harry to call me Ron and it was like Harry's my husband Ron's his friend he lives in Ottawa and I was picking up a telepathic message from my husband's friend that he wanted to a phone call which like was completely not what I was there to do. And I came to realize that, okay, when you go in and you're doing a job, whether it's the wells or balancing a property, you need to be protected psychically, you need to be focused, and you need to limit your interaction to those energies that can be of most assistance in that specific um, instance. So the, the dosing protocol I've mentioned already is a prime uh, tool for that. The other advice I always say is maintain your sovereign being and stay conscious. Um, so even though I might be interacting with uh, some of the sky dowsers as to where, where should the well go, uh, it's always me, it's always Susan, I'm the one walking around with the tools. So I'm, I know who I am and why I'm there. But we're, we're looking, you know, when we're out there, we ask to, to connect with the intelligent and beneficial energies of nature. There are earth energies, environmental energies, and psychic energies that can interfere with all of this, uh, um, well, with our accuracy. And sometimes it's trickster energy, and sometimes it's not. But uh, the triage protocol is one of the ways I deal with uh, filtering out non-beneficial extraneous energies. And we didn't do this last time I don't believe so I'm going to talk more about the um, the triage chart triage of course being the word you go to the hospital you go to emerge and they triage you so like who's who's in worse shape I used that word once with um, with a group and they said oh is that where you make uh, a collage out of trees it's like no it's figuring out what is the most important thing to do so um, so remember I, I mentioned there were there was a couple of farms in my area. They were 100 years old and they had never had water. And on one of them, um, on one of those properties, uh, after the farmer, it had been sold to um, a biker gang who actually put up a, a high wire fence and had a mountain lion in their in their, in their yard, which sounds ridiculous. And this is Canada, Ontario. And what on earth does somebody have a mountain lion in there for? Um, and I think they had the lion there as a physical protection, so nobody's going to come and mess with whatever they were doing. So when I went in with my triage protocol, I found that uh, the, the neighborhood did not support um, the, uh, the finding of a well in that place. So what on earth is that about so here's here's how here's how i do it so i've done my protocol as i go in so now i'm clear i know what i'm doing i know what i'm trying to do uh with the triage protocol uh i ask and this I mean, i'm just going to say it. i mean i'm just going to say it i say with honor and respect and through my guides and these are the beings that i have asked for help within step two of my protocol with honor and respect and through my guides. So here I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going in through my guides. This is a way I maintain psychic protection. So you don't know what you're finding out there. You don't just open the door and jump in. Through my guides. 
and I go in with honor and respect because I find that there's a lot of energies that can be skittish. And if you go in in a threatening way, um, they can, they can uh, choose not to cooperate. This will be particularly important a little bit later when we talk about diverting uh, water into a dry well. Because in that case, you, are, have, you have to convince the water to move into the well. And if you go in aggressively, it's, it's uh, I think, less likely the water will move. So we go in with grace, with honor and respect. And through my guides, I, I say, I approach the energies of the neighborhood and ask for cooperation in finding the best place to drill, to site and drill a well that will meet the needs of this family. So I use a lot of words, and you're going to go, what the heck is she talking about? Uh, but this is, once you get used to saying this and doing this, it becomes a pattern. It's just the method. And as uh, I've mentioned somewhere along the line, I've written several books on all this, including one on water wells, so it's, it's pretty easy to follow along. So I've asked, with honor and respect to my guides, I approach the energy of the neighborhood and ask for cooperation. And in that case of that farm with the biker gang and the mountain lion, I got a no. And uh, I, so there's several level, levels I go through, and I'm going to tell you what they are. But if you get a no to any of them, it's as if the universe is not supporting a well for this family. And it's been my experience that unless you can get all the levels, all the energy levels to say, yes, I support the family having a well, then you're more likely to have uh, a dry hole. That's just my experience. And, you know, part of what we do in dousing, and I'll say this for myself, because it's actually, um, I want to say it's simple and it's difficult. It's very simple to do. You just do it. Uh, but the difficulty is taming one's own emotions and one's knowledge of, oh, my goodness, if this doesn't work, you know, it's going to be terrible, blah, blah, blah. So it's, um, it can be a bit much. So this is a way I calm myself down. Um, I, I'm working around it. So the next level I do, so I, I, the first level was the neighborhood. Then I go and ask the property. I, I'll just repeat it again. With honor and respect and through my guides, I approach the energy of the property and ask for your cooperation in finding the best place to uh, put a well, uh, to site a well, uh, to meet the needs of this family. Uh, and then I get a yes. All right. Now I go into the elements. I, I ask the same question of the earth, of air, of fire, and of water. And I use, these are the elemental descriptions, uh, but fire for me is the electro, electromagnetic sense. Um, but in any case, I, I ask those things. The next thing I ask, if there's a house there, I ask the cooperation of the house. Uh, if I, I then ask for the cooperation of the ancestors associated with the property. And I think I told the story last time. I went on site to do a water well and found that there was a curse on the land which prevented water from coming in, which I then resolved. And um, I believe the water did come in. Uh, the, high, the guardians of the land, uh, we have a very strong native presence here. And... Um, they, and, you know, you've got to get their cooperation in there. We, in the, in the uh, British tradition, we might call those stewards of the land. But in North America, we tend to refer to them as the guardians of the land. Um, I remember going in once to do a geothermal well, which is where you pump uh, water up and then out. So it's hot water. And uh, my client, this is a cottage and uh, we're on a hill. He's, he's quite a tall man. He's standing above me on the hill. I'm standing below him. So I'm looking like way up at him. And uh, he wanted to dump the water into the lake, which would be very uh, hard on the environment. And I said, if you, sir, if you, um, if you dump the warm water into the lake, it'll kill uh, the ecosystem there. And he very aggressively said, you leave that to me. You just do, you just find the water. And it's, uh, so I wouldn't do it. Um, and so it takes courage to say no sometimes as well. I told a story the other week also about a fellow who wanted to put a trout pond in a place 
and the energies of the West of completion weren't there. And uh, I said, you know, sir, this is not going to work. We're 10 minutes in, but I'm telling you, it's not going to work. Anyway, so we, we have, we all need methods. And this is my method that I do it. The other thing I ask for in this triage protocol is the cooperation of the higher selves of the owners. So that may seem self-evident that the uh, owners want to have water, but I have had the experience where a husband and wife, um, unbeknownst to the husband, the wife did not want the result that was that he was asking for. And when you get that conflict uh, between the owners, that can disrupt um, the, 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 the happy result. I always ask the client before I get there, have you uh, picked a driller? Do you know who's going to drill it? And this is important in terms of knowing what kind of drill rig or uh, mechanical means they have to drill. Also uh, for the individual, because I know some drillers, I think maybe this is less common now, but some drillers don't support uh, dosing on a, or sorry, some drillers don't support drilling on a spot that a doser has flagged. Uh, that was the case in one of my first wells where I said to them, my client, because I was just beginning, I said, if you don't get water, you don't have to pay me, but you have to drill on my flag. And um, and I don't think they got water. I went back in and said, well, did you drill on the flag? No. So, he, you know, he drilled a foot off. So when we put the flag in, and I use the uh, little metal flags that you can get at the uh, uh, in hardware stores. It's a metal piece with a little orange or red flag on it. Uh, get a bunch of those. They come in 25 uh, flag packs. You always have those with you. They just stick them in the ground. And when you put them in the ground to mark your spot, you would, can then actually write on it what your depth is, what your volume is. And I've taken to putting uh, a little sticker with my name and website on it because if I am a successful dowser, then I want my uh, I want my name on the flag so the driller knows who I am and then they can call me in for another another go. Um, so we want to know uh, we ask we ask for the cooperation of the driller, and we ask for the cooperation of all factors known and unknown. So for this is true for my house clearing and um, human clearing, as well as getting ready to dose a water well. I like to get everything to a yes. Uh, and before I proceed any further. So that, that's, uh, that's kind of the psychic energies. If you get a no on some of these things, that slows you down because then you have to figure out why. Why won't the earth cooperate? Why won't the guardians cooperate? And in fact, on that, um, just recalling now, when I went to do that uh, geothermal well, it was like a two hour drive north, and I'm driving up there, I'm doing this not only the, protocol, the dosing protocol on the drive-in, the triage protocol. And when I was doing it for this man, for the geothermal, the guardians said no. And uh, I'd never met him. So I'm going, well, I'm trying to negotiate with the guardian. Well, guardians, I'm sure he's a, I'm sure he's a lovely person. <laughs> but then when we had that incidence where he was ready to pump the, the hot water into the lake, I understood why the guardians had said no. So it's a, it's a way of protecting yourself as well. Of course, this, I should have said this right at the top, before you accept a job, you dose whether it is in your best interest to do so and if it is safe for you to do so. Uh, I'm reminded now of uh, before I, you know, we learn through mistakes. And one of the reasons we share is so that people don't have to do it. I carry my cell phone in a uh, on my body all the time, which maybe disrupts my energy flow a little bit, but it's a safety mechanism so that if I end up someplace and my, let's say my purse is someplace else, my, my briefcase, you know, my tools are someplace else, if something happens, I have my phone. Um, and I went in, it was, uh, I even hesitate to tell the story, but I will. So I'm, I'm called up there. I go in and it's clearly some kind of cult um, area. It's a cult uh, commune, I guess, run by a charismatic man. And everybody else is female. So, okay, well, I can deal with that. So he says, well, I want to show you where the, uh, 
where our existing well is. Okay, we go into the house. So the well is down the basement. And there's a, he opens a trap door in the floor. There's a ladder there. And then we both go down into a cinder block basement with a dirt floor. And there's the well inside the house, which at, like that's, that's not the right place for a well. Then, so I'm down there. And then he says, oh, I just have to go and check on something. And he leaves. And it, I don't know how long I stood there before it occurred to me, you know what, this is probably not a really good place for me to be. And I got out of the basement, I got out of the house, nothing happened. But it was a real wake up call. Uh, somebody needs to know where you are. So a lot of us are sole practitioners, we're driving around the countryside, we need somebody to know where we are. Uh, what your client's name and phone number and address is, email address and all that. And I, at this point, on Google Earth, I share my location with members of my family. So no matter where I am, uh, like if I lose my phone, um, it doesn't help me. But like the phone is on my body and my family knows where I am. And worst case, they can come and find me. Now, this maybe sounds paranoid, and what has this got to do with dosing a well? It has everything to do for us being safe as we do our work. Um, and whether you're a man or a woman, young or old, you need to look after yourself first. So there is my warning on all of that. Um, well, let's look a little bit at... Um, what should we look at? Let's look a little bit, where does water come from? The water cycle, this is a bit of a science thing. Obviously it rains, the water goes into the ground, percolates down through uh, whatever's there and ends up in the earth. Uh, and then we put holes down there and pull it up one way or the other. Depending on the geology of the place, there, you might have a different uh, kind of well-constructed method. So it's useful to know um, before you go out, what kind of rock you're dealing with. And I believe I mentioned last time the well records up in Ontario here, our government uh, records and makes accessible well records so we can see the depth and uh, geological strata of every well that has been dosed. So if I'm going into a place uh, that is maybe sandy, that they might... Um, might be a sand point, there might be a drilled well, a dug well. Um, most, in, in our area, most, most wells are drilled at this point, although there's, there's still uh, some hand, uh, hand dug wells, those, those uh, uh, one yard wide uh, cement casings. So be sure to look at the well, look for well records uh, on your government website, Ministry of the Environment, whatever you have. Um, and then whatever your regulations are, you need to be aware of that. Because you might find the best place, most beautiful place uh, for water, but if it's close to the septic or close to the um, uh, a, a leachate plume or proximity to other wells, you can't put your well there. The other thing, we talked about buried electricals. Of course, you want to be away from that. Uh, and also there's overhead electricals. So when you go on site, look up and see where the overhead electricals are and you have to be set back from that because when the drill rig comes in and the big arm goes up uh, the, your driller wants to be well away from um, from those electrical lines and um, just uh, before Christmas there was a, a young person who had just got her first drill rig you know she was young and I guess she was in a hurry and um, and I don't know what happened, but the uh, the drill rig itself touched the, the electrical wires and she was killed instantly. So this is non-trivial stuff. So uh, that's something else to look for. When you're sighting your well, make sure it's well away from overhead wires and underground wires and your septic. The other thing um, to be well aware, well aware of and away from potentially are trees on the property. So uh, ask your client at the beginning, um, you look around, what are the trees? If there's some beautiful mature trees, they may want to keep them. Uh, but uh, ask your client what they're willing to give up 
for the well. I usually start, you know, if the client says, I really want to keep this old maple here, then I'll avoid that. And if I can find a good spot away from the trees so nothing has to be cut down, uh, then, then we'll flag that. If we can't find the proper spot in the, in the clear area, then, you know, say, sir, you may have to cut down this tree. Also, when you're setting the well before the house is built, you want to make sure that after the house is built that the well can still be serviced. Uh, so if it's in the backyard and he, he puts a big fence up and plants all these trees and all the rest of it, you can't get a truck in to service it. And you and you will need eventually to get, you know, the big truck comes in to drill it, but eventually in the life of the well, there'll be some service needed. So try to find a spot where uh, they can get at it from here to there. So make sure the ground slopes away. It's got to be accessible for maintenance, separated from contaminants, the livestock, and all the rest of that. So for me, when I started out, I knew nothing. I knew how to dose, and that was it. And it helped me a lot to understand how, uh, what, the, what the mechanics of the well is. So typically, you have a, a hole in the ground. You've got a pipe in there, a casing of some kind. The pump goes down to a certain level in the, wa- in the, uh, in the uh, well casing. Uh, typically, the driller will drill deeper than the water level to give you some um, backlog, to give you a reservoir, and then the pump is placed somewhere down there. Uh, from the top of the well, you've got electricity in here now, you, and you've got a trench, your water line. Uh, so one of the things I always ask my client then, if the house is not built, where will your utility room be? And then we think about, okay, how far do we have to trench the water line and the electrical line from the wellhead to the house? So the further away it is, the bigger pump you need, it gets more expensive to, uh, to operate. And then inside the house, there's usually a water pressure tank and uh, that goes into the house supply. I know that's fascinating, not. However, if you know what you're trying to do, it really helps a lot. Um, some sometimes you just get like a couple of gallons a minute or one gallon a minute and there's nothing you could do about that in which case you might recommend to your client that they have a cistern which can be a big plastic or cement uh, container sits outside generally and the well just keeps pumping out slowly into the cistern and then the house draws that down as you go along so that that's a place that's that's a configuration so, you know, honestly, I found as I go about my business that I've become uh, almost a consultant to the client because the driller may or may not tell them these sorts of things. Um, and the, regulator, the regulators may or may not tell them certain things. So the doser sort of becomes um, it's like a midwife almost, the midwife of the well, where the client, maybe it's their first time, uh, drilling a well, and they really don't know what they don't know. Um, the other thing is that it, it, it should be, the well should be produced by a licensed contractor. And uh, I know some people just go ahead and dig ponds or do it themselves, but um, it's, uh, it's a safety thing, really, that it's a licensed contractor. They know how to uh, prepare a well and how to uh, make sure it's, it's uh, safe to drink. And then they provide the well records. So there's another uh, professional category that knows where water is, and those are the hydrogeologists, and they are trained to look at geology, hydro, water, geology, rock, hydrogeologists. And, um, and I've met many a hydrogeologist, and they often uh, don't respect the ability of the doser because they don't understand it. But hydrogeologists you know, look at those well records and look at the geology, and then they just give a guess, basically. So they don't, what dosers can do is perceive the little variations, the cracks in the granite or the, uh, or the containers of uh, limestone. The, the doser can go in and find the secret pocket of water, if you want to call it that. The hydrogeologist is looking at a chart and, and they, you know, it's, it's a respectable profession but we fine tune that. So uh, let's talk about geology a little bit. So uh, clay is a tough one. Um, 
depending on what you've got. Often, if you, if you, you know, it's interesting to, as you're driving to the site, here's another thing you can do. As you drive to the site and you go through a rock cut, let's say you've got a hill, you're meandering around your highway and the, and, uh, and the uh, road engineers have cut uh, a slice out of the hill to put the road in. And you can then see with your eyes what is there. So you might have sandstone, you might have um, granite, you might have limestone, uh, sand, clay, any old thing. It's fun in the winter. This is a great time uh, for us northerners where everything freezes up. When you're driving past that rock cut in the winter, you can see where the water is seeping out. And for me, that's very reassuring. So in Canada, you see these icicles kind of pouring down. And it's proof, uh, as if we needed it, that there is water between the layers and that it comes out in certain spots. It doesn't come out all over the place. It comes out in little places. So uh, that's what the doser is, is looking for. But clay is a hard one. Um, uh, maybe, maybe other people have things to say on clay, but if you, if you know it's clay, then you really fine tune. It's really sharp in your sentence, uh, <laughs> your senses. In hard rock, you can look for those cracks. Uh, with limestone, uh, I find that bold. Uh, we have a lot of limestone, so I always think, you know, we're looking at underground rivers to some, and it, sometimes. So if you, in your mind, you strip away, you know, a million years, and there was a river flowing here, and we know when we look at a river today, that the bank of the river is above the bottom of the river. And what we're trying to find is the bottom of the old riverbed so that whatever water is there is flowing into that depression. So that's kind of what we're looking for. Uh, artesian wells are when, and, and, we, and the water in the ground we call uh, an aquifer. So an artesian well is when the hole or the pipe or the spring uh, there's a hole in the rock, um, and the water table is above the hole, so water just keeps pouring out. So back in the day, they used to let those things flow, but it's usually better to conserve the water by capping it if you can. Uh, we mentioned geothermal a bit earlier. Uh, I'm not sure how many folks are using that, but um, it's not always water that's used, but a geothermal system uh, heats building using the temperature of the earth. So you can put vertical wells in, and, uh, and then they're pumped uh, with a food grade um, um, liquid of some kind. That's a closed system. So I haven't, I haven't done too many of those, and I don't know if it's as popular now as it once was. Um, so rocks that transmit water are coarse gravel. This is from um, most, most transmittable. Trout brings the most water through coarse gravel, fine gravels, coarse sand, medium sand, chalk, and clay. So if you're in England, I know it's tough. There's a lot of clay there. Uh, where I am, I'm in uh, moraine, glacial moraine. I've got a lot of coarse gravel and sand, so that, that comes in pretty easily. And then, um, and then again, with the hard rock, you're looking for um, the cracks in that. So... Thank goodness for the internet. Uh, we have a we had a question on how do you know what the geology is? If you uh, you every jurisdiction will put out a geological map. So if whatever your area is, you can say uh, geology of your state or your province, and um, it will many many things will come up, and it will have a legend, and it will show you what's going on. I did a, um, a water well workshop off in Nova Scotia in the uh, East Coast, and they have got really difficult terrain. And, um, and, and there are many tectonic plates smashing together there. So that's one thing to think about on the edges of the continent. There are different tectonic plates and completely different processes going on. So it really does help um, to take the time to look at these things. Uh, also, in Nova Scotia, I found a place where they were uh, showing, um, um, let me just see what the word was. It was, um, uh, it was uranium, right. So that's another thing you want to know. 
uh, is the uranium down there? In my area here, we have methane uh, underground. And also, we're on top of an ancient sea. So if you go down 100 feet, over 100 feet in some places, you hit the salt pan. So knowing the geology before you go in is really, really important. And uh, you look for water well records or uh, test hole records or bore hole logs. And if you Google all that stuff, you'll probably be able to find something. And those, um, and those records will show you the depth and the volume, which is really kind of handy. So that's kind of the technical side of things. And it's, it's not dosing per se, but if you're going to be successful, uh, well, doser, you need to know that stuff so you can serve your client because they sure don't know that stuff. So let's talk about communicating with the spirit of place. And that's kind of what we were doing with that triage protocol, the spirit of the neighborhood. And we need to get uh, a yes from every level on that. Uh, so there's no curses or anything. So the on-site procedure, uh, as, I'm, as I'm driving out there, I do the dosing protocol. I might do it again uh, once I get there. I might do the, uh, I always do the, the directions protocol. I've probably already done the triage protocol. I, I speak with my client. Uh, what, what are you looking for? Is this residential, commercial, agricultural? How many people in your family? Any machine shops, any animals, you know, what are the water features? If people want to put sprinklers in or swimming pools. You need to know what you're looking for. You also need to look around at the neighbors to make sure that you don't interfere with anything else going on there. So then the, the dosing, I always say the dosing is the easiest part. You just pull out your rods, and this is all I say, <laughs> take me to the best place to drill. Cross when you get there, I put the flag in. So, I, you know, if there's all that preamble, all that talking, all that prep, but once you're done, and then one thing I forgot to mention there, I ask my client to leave. Once I've spoken with him and I know what he wants, I say, no, please go away, come back in 20 minutes, and uh, they'll, you know, go in their car or they'll go someplace. They usually have something else to do. So once you've done all that prep, it's just you pull out your rods, show me the bless, best place to drill across when you get there, and there's your flight. Boom. And I think I mentioned this. I noticed uh, early in my career that I was generally already standing on the spot because my subconscious mind had taken me there. But I put the flag in, um, and then I double check. I'll walk away, and I'll say, Rods, please point to the best place to drill. And I'll, I'll sort of just face different directions, and the rods will keep moving me back in there. Uh, then I do um, uh, depth and volume. But... And let me give you two other search methods. My, my preferred one I generally do, take me to the best place to drill to find the water. Method two, uh, find the water dome and veins and then find the suitable vein and follow it. This is a Bruce McGill technique. What's a water dome? What, we talk about primary water coming from the earth. It's a big flooding thing that comes up and then veins, uh, water veins come off that. So you end up walking in a circle, you end up, uh, you're, and, and your rods take you in that, and then you ask your rods to show you uh, each vein that comes off, and then you find the most suitable vein and follow it, and then, and then flag that. Now, method three, Mr. Ed Stillman taught me that one. Find the edges of the water course where 10% of the maximum is available, then find the center of the water system. So Ed's a technical guy, and... Uh, I like things complicated, but I find that it, it's harder to understand that one for me. Find the edges of the water course where 10% of the water is, 10% of the maximum is available, then find the center of the water system. So you find the edge and you walk into it and across when you get to the center. And as Ed uh, has said, I ask my dousing to be free from thought forms from, from living or dead humans. So again, in the case of those old farms where there was no water, you know, if I had allowed all those, a century of thought forms, we don't have water here, it would have been hard to find. I say, take me to the best place to drill for a water well that meets the needs of my client. And I always say for the sake of the children or grandchildren and for the animals. Because whatever we do for the sake of the children, it kind of activates uh, it activates things. And again, now we're moving more into that spiritual connection 
and the kind of uh, connection we're going to need to divert water. Finding depth, I'm going to give you two methods. One is the bishop's rule. And here's how I understand it. Walk at right angles away from the line of flow until a strong reaction is obtained. Walk back across the line of flow until a similar reaction is obtained on the other side. Half the distance between these marks is the depth of the flow. So that's for depth. So that reminds us a bit about edge thing. Find the edges of the water course where 10% of the maximum is available, then find the center. So he's found the stream there. Bishop's rule, um, walk at right angles away from the line of flow until a strong reaction is obtained. Walk back across the line of flow until a similar reaction is obtained on the other side. Half the distance between these marks is the depth of flow. Okay, so that's a complicated one. Now, I'm always, I'm always, how do we do this quickly? So I bracket. So when I'm doing depth, I just bracket it. I get my rods out and I say, um, is the depth of the, uh, let's see, is the depth of the well, or how deep should the driller go to uh, find a spot for a viable well? Is it zero to 50 feet? And my rods go yes or no. Okay, I got to know. Is the depth of the well 50 to 60 feet? Yes. Huh. Is the depth of the well 50 to 5 feet? Yes. Is it 50, 51 feet? Okay, my, my depth is 51 feet. So I call that bracketing. Um, in your jurisdiction, there may be a minimum depth for a well. You need to know that. Uh, typically, they, they look for a slightly deeper well so as to avoid surface runoff. Okay, so for finding volume, I bracket as well. And again, this is the easiest way to do it. You, you need to know what your target is, what you're trying to get. But my, um, uh, I'll, I'll say, okay, so I'm standing there. And I'm usually standing right on my flag. At this point, I've got my flag. And I... I've got, so I've got the location, now I've got the depth, and now I'm going for volume. Uh, is it over five gallons a minute? Yes. Is it between five and ten? No. Is it five to, is it ten to fifteen? Yes. Over five gallons a minute? Yes. Five to ten? No. Ten to fifteen? Yes. Ten, eleven. Okay, eleven gallons a minute. So that is as fast as I do it. It's, uh, um, and then, so that, so I do my numbers with my rods, and then I might uh, pick up my pendulum because it's good to uh, use your different tools to confirm your answers. So I might pick up, so I've done that with my rods, and now uh, with my pendulum, I'll say, is it true that if a driller goes to 51 feet uh, at this spot that they will get 11 gallons a minute for the family? Yes. Okay, and then I, I write that stuff on the uh, on the flag. Anyway, so that's your basic thing. We've got we've well, got a few minutes here. Let's um uh, we want to talk about diverting a stream, and this doesn't happen every time. And I don't usually tell clients it's possible. But in the cases of extreme need, where uh, this is for the sake of the children and for the sake of the family, and maybe they can't afford to drill a new well, or who knows why, but um, it's sometimes possible to divert underground water into uh, a dry well or into a dry hole just with our dosing. So the way that goes, uh, the way I've done it, and the way I believe Ed is, teaches this way as well, uh, you get your flag. So how do you know where, well, okay, so let's start back up slightly. Let's, I use a case of um, uh, a woman that I knew that she didn't have a lot of money. She uh, let other people use her house. The well wasn't very good to begin with, and they left the toilet running like for two days, and the well went dry. So and that kind of messed things up. Uh, so we knew there was water there, although not very much. 
So I went in, I spoke to the intelligent and beneficial energies of nature. I asked, are there more water streams? Are there water streams that are willing to divert their flow into the catchment area for this water well? I got a yes. Okay, thank you. So that I got agreement. Yes, we will cooperate. That's part of that triage protocol. Okay, so now I've got, in one hand, I've got a sledgehammer. In the other hand, I've got a rebar. Uh, it's all very heavy. And I have my, I also have my dosing tools. And I say, okay, you know, can I use, so, so I, I do every step. Can I uh, use a sledgehammer and rebar and uh, hammer on the rebar in such a way so as to divert the water into the dry well. I need to get a yes on that. Okay, uh, the water's willing. I'm being told I can do it. I say, okay, now where should I place the bottom end of the rebar? So now the rebar, a rebar is just a piece of metal, uh, heavy metal sticking up. Uh, I place this three or four foot piece of metal, this rebar, in a place that I have dosed. Where should I place it? Right there, okay. Then I ask, um, in what direction should I hammer the rebar? Because I know where the well is, I know where the stream is, uh, but it doesn't necessarily, you know, I, I still need to dose where do I, uh, where do I what, what direction do I hammer it into? It would make sense to hammer it towards the well, but, but I don't know. So you get, you get a sense of, okay, I want to hammer from this direction, and then you dose, how many times do I hammer uh, the bar? Uh, and it works sometimes. Now, I believe Harold McCoy told a story, the late uh, Harold McCoy, who ran OR, our Ozark Research Institute. I think he said he had done this with a map, on a map with a pen, and uh, water came into the well. So that's a pretty sophisticated technique. But it's so, you know, I, I don't tell people I can do that, but if, um, if, it, if I can make it happen, I certainly do. Um, the other uh, ad advanced technique really is map dosing. Um, and I, I tend to make a lot of use of Google Earth. I use satellite imagery and um, I, I look at where are the streams running, where do I see water standing in the fields. You can see a lot with Google Earth and you can go back and forth in time with the images so you get a pretty good sense of the image. Um, some people, uh, will completely do a map dose of the area before going out there. And they find the water on the map and then confirm it there. So if you're going to do a map dose, uh, you can pull an image off Google Earth and just make a note of everything that you can. And um, map dosing, um, basically you dry, draw a straight edge down one side of your map with a pendulum running in your other hand and you say please pendulum please circle when my straight edge is over the target you go one way then you draw the line at that point and then you go the other way so you're going horizontally and vertically uh, you go the other way pendulum please swing clockwise when the straight edge is over the target which is the well draw that line and where they intersect is the place where you're going to draw your well uh, of course, transforming, we'll just quickly, just really quickly talk about transformation. This is part of the dosing protocol, steps four and five. So it's not just uh, informational dosing, uh, yes, here, no, there. But we can transform the energy of the water and transform the quality of the water. And some people have successfully removed toxins from the water by disconnecting the frequencies and energies associated with a particular toxin and then enhancing the energies of the water so that it meets ministry regulations, is good tasting, um, and meets the needs of the family. So th there we are, 9 o'clock already. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it there for now. Um, if people would like to send me uh, an email, susan at doser.ca, I can easily send the dosing protocol. It's a two-pager. Uh, it's pretty easy. And, of course, I've written all these books, one of which is um, Water Wells, What a Doser Needs to Know. So, uh, I, Ed and Sherry, do you have any questions or comments, or what are your thoughts? 
think you've done an excellent, How about done you, an Ed? excellent job. I think you've done an excellent job of uh, oh, providing you. all of this really good information. So I appreciate that very much. Well, thank you. Okay, so uh, did you have any other announcements you wanted to make, Susan, about like uh, which conferences or conventions you're going to that people well, can uh, look up? Well, I haven't actually been accepted at any conferences yet, <laughs> but it, it, it comes out. But I expect I'll be at uh, ASD uh, National in Plymouth, New Hampshire, June 3 to 7, I believe. And uh, I'm certainly hoping to be at the West Coast Conference, which is July 3 to 7, I think. And um, and we'll just play it by ear. Um, whoever's have, have pendulum will travel. Great. Um, okay. And uh, what was your website again? www.doser.ca. Great. Thank you. Um, Jeanette, did you have any questions? Susan, I really appreciate your exceptional um, coverage of everything a dowser needs to know about water well dowsing. I don't know if I have any questions. I just love how how does someone get better and better as uh, time goes on. And it is, um, you're really excellent at what you do. And I really appreciate you giving us the directional protocol and forward thinking about the future of the children, the grandchildren, and the animals. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. And the, your triage has been helpful. If anyone uh, has a chance, Susan's books are so simple and uh, they're well worth uh, looking at. And uh, of course, uh, you can listen to this conference call at dowser.org, um, again, if you're a member only. And thanks for mentioning Take Me to the Best Spot, something so simple. You mentioned your the late Bruce McGill. And thanks for working at this for over 20 years and honoring and respect. We want to honor and respect our guides and it, keeping a, a safe buddy system, whether it's with family members or taking somebody with us so we don't get in a uh, rough spot. And you're... I would thank you for giving us the uh, t teaching techniques of the geothermals, uh, knowing our jurisdiction, uh, basic water dowsing, a little bit about geology, and we look forward to becoming all better dowsers with simple techniques that you gave us tonight. <laughs> well, thank, <laughs> thank you, you so much. Dream come true. Dream come true. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate everybody. Ed, did you have any more comments? I'm I'm very pleased with what we learned, and uh, uh, frankly, I learned some new things myself. So I appreciate well, that very much. <laughs> Sherry, yes. Uh, were you were you able to make an announcement about the Discover Dowsing teleconference tomorrow? I did make one at the very beginning, Roxanne. But now that you're on, I was just going to remind everybody. So now that you're on, I'm going to have. You come on and give a little more detailed information. So go ahead, Roxanne. Well, tomorrow we're really fortunate to have Heather Wilkes, who's the vice president of the um, Dowson Society of Victoria in Melbourne, uh, come on. She's uh, speaking to us from Australia, so this is my first international teleconference. And she uh, has been inspired by Raymond Grace to do a pro uh, protocols on dousing for um, uh, rain, for weather, for um, droughts, for fires. And I'm most impressed by, by the kind of things she's done. I mean, just uh, on Saturday, they had a freak hailstorm of golf ball hail balls coming down. And she, she got out her dowsing uh, uh, tools and went outside and, and told the told the uh, the sky to stop it in the hail uh ball stopped. <laughs> it sounds it sounded to me like um, Harry Potter's rods to the ready. So uh, it'll be very interesting to have us all uh, hear her 
uh, talk about the amazing things that can be done. We know that focus and tension does uh, affect things, and American Indians have been doing their rain dances for eons. Uh, so we we know that um, dousing and intention can cause rain. Right now, they're also having floods in Australia, and there's many other components to this. So I think it'll be a really exciting call. It's at uh, five o'clock Pacific, eight o'clock Eastern, and that phone number is six four six eight seven six nine nine two three. And the participant code is one two six three six zero three nine four. And if you forget, it's uh, go to dowsers dot org. So thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Roxanne. I'm glad you came on to uh, give more detailed information. Great. So let's see here. Any more announcements, Jeanette or Ed? No, I'm I'm clean. Thank you very much. Excellent uh, presentation today. We can't thank you enough, Susan, and everybody uh, contributing tonight. Thanks, uh, Ed and Sherry. And we appreciate everyone coming together, and hopefully we all can become better dowsers and make a better world. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, And remember, next next, uh, month, February 17th, same time, same phone number, we will have uh, Jenny Matasha on and uh, her version of water dowsing. She's a very fascinating dowser because she's going to also talk about a few of the other things she does, like finding missing persons. And she's been on Coast to Coast Radio Show. I'm sure you are all been familiar with that. So... I think it will be fascinating. So we hope to see you next month on the 17th of February. Uh, Ed, go ahead with what you were going to say. Oh, (laughs) I I feel like uh, I really learned a lot today. Uh, It was nice of her to talk about some of the things that I taught her, but she also taught me. So I'm very pleased with that. And um, I still continue to do my dowsing and, Nor, nor, nor. Now, one thing I wanted you to uh, go ahead and just give a little information, a little more information on was the uh, water domes, Ed. Oh, the water dome itself? Well, you have to find the dome. Uh, The thing is that you have to know what you have to do to locate the dome. And the dome is a very... uh, uh, large amount of water with as as uh, she was uh, as she was talking about <clears throat> Susan was talking about then you find your your veins and so the veins will come out from the the, the uh, thing we're talking about and you have to be able to locate it and mark it and so it's a little bit difficult the first couple of times you try it but you can learn it quite easily and uh, she described it very accurately, that it is there. Now, you have to walk around in the area and have your rod point out the direction to the dome. Please show me the direction to the dome. Is there a dome toward my eastern side or my north side? And if you get a yes or no, then you can say, okay, please take me to the dome. Well, and when I do that, I'm actually walking around trees, just following my rod, and I get there, and my rod will touch me on my right shoulder, is the way I set things up. And so that's how you find it. And once you do that, then you can find all of the veins and uh, see what you want to do about uh, drilling into one of those or drilling into the dome itself. I've seen that done, and it can be done but uh, it's pretty expensive because it's all the water in that whole area. Uh, Sherry, is there something else, or did I get it all pretty well? Uh, Yeah, thanks, Ed. Uh, uh, I guess I was under the impression that you shouldn't drill right into the the main part of the dome, so uh, I know one of the other dowsers told me that 
to drill into one of the side veins going off of the dome. Oh, yeah. And so I'm, I'm interested that you could actually drill into the dome itself. Well, but you have to douse whether you are capable of drilling into the dome itself and is it proper, right, and correct for you to do it. In other words, you can't just okay. walk up to it and, and jump on this. You have to, to do your own full dowsing protocol to see whether you are not allowed to, do, to douse the dome itself in the middle or you can do it. Some of them you can. Not very many, but uh, most of them you really can't uh, uh, douse the center of it or any part of it. But yes, then you go find the, uh, now you know at least it's there, and now you can go and uh, work on the, uh, the veins itself. And then you can find out what you need from the veins and which one you want to have, uh, have drilled. Okay, thank you for, clear, yeah, thanks for clearing yeah. that up. Okay. All right. Um, Susan, are you still on? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, did you have any more questions you needed to answer from uh, that were given to you at the beginning of the call? Uh, oh, no, one woman asked about uh, can you, um, what if there's an earthquake? Can you dosing, can you dose something, can you dose a well? that won't be affected by future earthquakes or blasting. And I don't think you can really, because you can look at probabilities. You know, if you're um, in a industrial area, then there's probably gonna be blasting. If you're beside a road, there could be blasting. So uh, I did have a, a client uh, who wanted me to, he hadn't built a house yet, and he's showing me around. He says, now, this is where I'm going to blast out the basement. And I said, well, I think you better have me back after. So, you know, it, it's all unpredictable down there. Excellent, excellent advice, definitely. And anything in the future is a probability, so you need to douse out that probability, zero to 100. Yeah. So anything else, Susan? No, that's it. I really appreciate the work that you guys are doing and bringing the information out. And, um, it's, it, you know, we are in legacy mode. So those of us who have a little bit of experience, if we can share it with others, then that's really what we're here to do. So, And we're looking forward to new people coming in and becoming water well dancers. We definitely are, and that's a good note to stop on. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming on board with us. And we'll see you next month, Monday the 17th of February, with uh, Gina Mate Jenny Matesha. Okay. <laughs> All okay. right. So thank you, Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.